First reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have heard already of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and shares in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God and its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God and boldness and confidence through faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Paul's words to the Ephesians expand theologically on the narrative that I'm about to read. The revelation of Christ to the Gentiles is what Paul explains for us in Ephesians. The Magi who came to Christ represented the Gentiles. And in Christian history, the Magi have come to stand in for all of the nations that were not Israel. And when they came to Jesus, God was revealed to them. And so here now, the story from Matthew chapter 2. The visit of the Magi. In the time of Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to Christ. Would you pray with me? Living God, through the words of this ancient story and the truth of your living Christ, speak to us now so that our hearts and lives may be lightened by the grace and truth that comes through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. As I said to the kids, today is the Feast of Epiphany, and so we have our star banners out. The word epiphany, it comes from the Greek. It simply means manifestation or revelation. So it is a celebration of the revelation of God. There are many ways that we celebrate epiphany, and many parts of the world celebrate epiphany much more than we do. Especially in 
parts of the world that are Latin, Epiphany is maybe bigger than Christmas because the wise men bring the gifts rather than Santa Claus bringing the gifts. In some parts of the world, they chalk the door, and we'll do some of that tonight as a way of blessing the house at the beginning of a new year. It has been the custom of this congregation over the last number of years, long before I got here, to do star words at an Epiphany service. So we'll do that tonight as well. You're invited to that service, dinner at 5.30, service at 6.30. That's the end of the advertisement. But the star words are something that you get at the service that has a little word on it. And you think maybe that's a vessel or vehicle for God to speak to you in the coming year. Epiphany reminds us of how much we long to know what God is trying to tell us. Have you ever wondered what's God trying to tell me? The last few years I've gotten these little star words and I have to confess I have no idea what God was trying to tell me in those words. The first star I got was Pathfinder. And somebody came up to me and said, Patrick, are you lost? I said, I don't know. The next year I got the word repair. And someone else came up and said, that sounds like a lot of work. I said, I'm not sure what God's trying to tell me. The third year, last year, I got the word approachability. And I went to several people and said, do I have a problem with approachability? What's God trying to tell me? A sleepless night or a series of sleepless nights. You wonder, what's God trying to tell me in this? A dream that sticks with you in the morning and captures your imagination, the kind of dream you might only have once or twice a year. You wonder, what's God trying to tell me in this? You're single, you're looking for a relationship, and you keep running into the same person over and over, and you think, what's God trying to tell me in this? You look at your horoscope in the morning. Any of you do that? You look at your horoscope, and the circumstances of your life happen to fit that prediction exactly. And you think, what is God trying to tell me in this? The world is rocked by earthquakes and fire. And some of us wonder, what is God trying to tell us in this? This has been the wettest year on record for North Carolina. What, what is God trying to tell us in this? We try to read the signs of our personal lives and the world around us to hear God speaking. And we wonder in, in moments that are big and small, in moments that seem blindingly clear and often very complex, what, what is God trying to say to us? At the center of the story of Epiphany is the Magi who were reading the signs and listening for what God was trying to tell them. Now, the translation I read says wise men from the east. Probably many of you know them as the three wise men. And some of you may know them as the three kings because we sing we three kings of Orient are. Well, newsflash, we don't know if there were three. There might have been 200. Matthew doesn't tell us. They just brought three gifts and so Christian history has assumed that there must have been three. I think maybe there were more. And the word for them is actually magi, not wise men or kings. Magi identifies really who they were. They were priests in Persia. And part of their vocation in life was to study the stars for signs of what God was trying to say, for some event or portent, or wonder that might be about to happen. And so it says they saw a star at its rising, not necessarily in the east. The translation's hard to puzzle out, but the best thing is really they saw the star at its rising. And they took that to mean that a king had been born. There was a belief in the ancient world. Some people have this belief today. I think I've seen it in a, in a Disney cartoon at some point. But there, there's a, a belief in the ancient world that when a person is born, a star comes into being. And when a person dies, the star goes out of being. This was a very common belief. And so these magi saw a star sort of coming into being and took that as a sign that a king had been born. When you hear that story... 
You may wonder, is that what an epiphany is? A star in the sky? As if you were to go into a dark room and you flip the light switch on and everything's clear, like a bolt out of the blue? It works that way for some people, not for many. Thomas Merton was perhaps the greatest American spiritual giant of the 20th century, Trappist monk from Kentucky. He wrote that he had three epiphanies in the course of his lifetime, only three. The first one was in 1940 in a church service, the Mass of St. Francis in Havana, Cuba. And at this church service, it was very noisy. They had left the doors of the church open, and he said you could hear the trolley cars go by, and you could hear the buses, you could hear the kids selling newspapers and other kids selling lottery tickets. It was so noisy he could barely hear the bells ringing for communion. And then children came into the church, and they sat in the pews, and they started making lots of noise. The noise just kind of kept building until finally the first line of the Apostles' Creed and some kid just shouted, top of his lungs, right in the Apostles' Creed. And Merton said it was like a, a thunderclap in his soul. The epiphany he had was this. That's the church. That was his epiphany. Right there in that noisy, messy, crowded place in Havana was the church. And then he wrote this. He said, I knew with absolute and unquestionable certainty that before me, between me and the altar, somewhere up in the center of the church, up in the air, or any other place, because in no place, but directly before my eyes or directly present to some apprehension or other of mine, which was above that of the sense, was at the same time God in all his essence, all his power, God in the flesh and God in himself, and God surrounded by the radiant faces of the thousand million uncountable numbers of saints contemplating his glory and praising his holy name. Now that's an epiphany. If one of the spiritual giants of the 20th century only had three of those in his lifetime, what do you think the odds are that we're going to have many? Probably pretty slim. I don't know many people who have epiphanies like that. Most of us, the epiphany is not a star blazing in the sky. But here's the thing. That wasn't the epiphany for the magi either. If you think about children's pageants you've seen, you might imagine a star kind of going in front of the Magi, leading them down the aisle of the church to Bethlehem. That's not really how it happened. The Magi saw the star at its rising, but then the star sort of went away. They had to go by faith to seek this out. So I kind of imagine the conversation went something like this. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw it. Did you see it? What do you think it means? I don't know. What do you think it means? How are we going to find out? Maybe we should start for Jerusalem. That's one step. Okay, let's go. They don't call it the journey of the Magi for no reason. That's how real-life epiphanies always go. They are slow to develop. They consist of hunches and guesses and vague intuitions. I think God might be trying to tell me something in this, but I don't know what. And so I'll have to take a step in faith to follow it through and see if God is in it. For most of us, the epiphany requires a journey in the hope that God will guide us and be there. The first stop on the Magi's journey was in Jerusalem where they asked King Herod where the king of the Jews had been born. 
I want you to see for a minute the irony of this. The Magi come to King Herod and say, we have seen a star in the east that tells us the king of the Jews has been born. Herod thought he was the king of the Jews. He was threatened by that. Herod is known to history as an evil man. What follows in, in the Gospel according to Matthew in the next reading is known as the Massacre of the Innocents. That story, plus many other in the historical record, tell us that Herod was a tyrannical, despotic, corrupt, and evil ruler. He was threatened that one might have been born as the king of the Jews. And so he tried to co-opt secretly the Magi into telling him the location, but they would not do it. The kingdom of God would not crash on the shoals of a despotic leader. God's purposes have a way of working themselves out because God is in control. And so God led the Magi to Bethlehem. When they got there, it says they saw the star again. You see, the star went away and then it came back. They saw the star again, and we read that they were overwhelmed with joy. I began to wonder this week, what did it mean that they were overwhelmed with joy? Because the way that the, the original text is phrased, it, it wants to let us know that their joy was way up here. It was about as high as it could go. I thought of times when I had been overwhelmed with joy. In looking back, to see that that small journey of faith bore fruit. That that small kernel or hunch that you thought God might be saying something turned out to, to be real. And you realize that the journey was not wasted. It was meaningful. Even though there were turns you did not expect and times you thought you were on the wrong road, God was guiding you all along. That's how most of our epiphanies go. They come in hindsight, not in foresight. They come when we look back and see where God has been leading us. Yet even still, this was not epiphany for the Magi. It was not the star that was their epiphany. It was not the journey that was their epiphany. It was not the realization that their faith was real, that was the epiphany. The epiphany was Jesus. Jesus was God's revelation, God's manifestation, standing there before them. Most likely this happened a couple of years after Jesus was born. He would have been a small child. And here the Magi show up to the house, and, and, and this is God's revelation standing before them, King of kings, Lord of lords. Not Herod the king, but this little one. Not the kingdom of Rome, but the kingdom of God, open to all. That was the manifestation, the epiphany for the Magi. It is almost impossible to know what God is trying to tell us in the complex situations of life and the world. Some events seem very clear and some events seem very confusing. And sometimes we look back on life and we feel like we can see that God was working and moving. And sometimes we look back on life and we say we have no idea what that was about and whether God was trying to tell us anything. Frederick Buechner describes the attempt to try to, to interpret what God is telling us as, as trying to say what the meaning of raindrops are on the rooftop. Or trying to put words to a spectacular sunrise. You just can't quite put words to it. Because in many cases, God is maddeningly unclear. But there's one thing God wants to be very clear about. And that is Jesus Christ. What God wants to show us in Jesus Christ is that God is putting the world right. That God will make things whole. That God 
is in charge, that the kingdom of God is real, and that we belong to God, and nothing will separate us from God's love. God wants us to know that so much, God becomes a human person to tell us in the flesh so we can't mistake the sign. And that's the epiphany. That's what I want you to hold on to underneath all of the hunches and questions and horoscopes and star words. I want you to hold on to the revelation of Jesus who is King of kings, Lord of lords, brother and friend who has claimed us and will not let us go. Amen.